This program is proudly brought to you by Telecom Limited and Daytech. Good night, Papua New Guinea. I'm Malcolm Waira, and welcome to another episode of In Focus. Tonight, we are joined by the International Monetary Fund Head of Office, Mr. Sorab Rafiq. We discuss some of the support programs the IMF is offering to the Papua New Guinea, as well as some of its key economic assessments. Sorab, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Welcome to our new offices as well. Uh, as you mentioned, it is your new office. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the history of the International Monetary Fund in Papua New Guinea over the years? The IMF and PNG, not many people know this, but it's had a very long relationship. I think PNG joined in October in 1975, a day before it joined the United Nations. So one of the first international institutions PNG joined when it became an independent state was the IMF. And throughout almost that 50 year history, there's been a constant engagement between the IMF and PNG. Now that engagement has taken on principally three forms. The first is surveillance. So throughout those 50 years, you'll have IMF teams coming in from Washington and doing surveillance and sort of looking at the risks to the economy, how the economy is doing, how, are, how is the country promoting prosperity. And a report is written every year based on the findings of the IMF team and the, the dialogue that takes place between the government and the IMF. So if anyone that wants, wants to go back and look at the history, all of that is online. The second way that the IMF has been engaged with PNG is through technical assistance. So the IMF provides a lot of policy advice, but it's pointless giving that policy advice if it cannot be acted upon. And so for, the, for it to be acted upon, you need institutions with strong technical capacity. So throughout the decades, the IMF has been engaged with technical assistance on PNG, helping build up the capacity of the civil service from the ground up. The third way in which the IMF has engaged uh, with PNG over the years is through financing assistance. And that's, I'm sure, something that, 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 that we'll, we'll get on to. Um, we've opened up a new office in part because of the, the IMF program, which is here to support the government's homegrown reform agenda. Um, you know, there's a 15 hour time difference between PNG and Washington. So having an office on the ground makes it, makes it much easier to sort of survey and sort of make sure that we have a sense of what's going on on the ground. And more importantly, to engage with the public and to engage with the media and to explain the IMF's work and what it is that we're doing here. And so that sort of explains why we opened up this new office. But the sort of dialogue between the IMF and the PNG and PNG has, has sort of gone on for many, many decades. Now, Saurabh, how does the IMF's role differ from the broader World Bank Group's uh, core mandate? So we are sister organizations, but, but we do differ slightly in our financing. So the World Bank tends to do more project-related financing. Whereas the IMF financing tends to go more towards the government and supporting sort of the, the, the government's uh, foreign exchange reserves um, and more towards budgetary support. Now, the advantage of IMF financing is that, number one, it's very fast and flexible when you, when, when you need it. And the third advantage of it is that it's, it's, it's if you look at it in the context of PNG, it's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's on concessional terms, so it's very cheap. So the country, PNG, gets to borrow at below market interest rates. Now, the advantage of that is that it gives the, the government breathing room. It knows that it can, get, it can access financing from the IMF at a very cheap rate, and it can therefore finance the government's operations, and that gives the government breathing space to undertake reforms and to push forward with its uh, re uh, reform agenda. And that's sort of how and why IMF financing uh, is, is useful. Now, I understand the IMF has just concluded its first review of its funded programs in Papua New Guinea. Uh, can you comment on that? 
Yes, yeah, so the first review uh, took place at the end of last year. That report has been made public. It was published in December of 2023. That's available online. So anyone who wants to sort of get a better understanding of of PNG's IMF program performance. All of it is sort of detailed in that document. Um, so far, program performance has been strong. The review was completed on time. Uh, and the challenge going forward is to make sure we maintain that reform momentum going forward. Under the review, the IMF has dispersed about uh, 88, US, 88 million US dollars, which is approximately about 329 million kina in budget support to the Morape government. How often does the IMF provide budgetary support to countries? Right, so the IMF here uh, is here to support the government's homegrown reform agenda. Government has an agenda, the IMF is only here to advise and assist on that. Now, as part of advising and assisting the government in its reform agenda is this IMF program. Now, the IMF program is 38 months just slightly over three years and every six months there's a review and based on that review will determine whether the next tranche of money is released now over the whole course of the the 38 months the program is worth roughly 1 billion us dollars so assuming that the program targets are met on time and the reviews are completed every six months then the money is dispersed and that's typically how IMF programs uh, programs work and sort of the program targets and whether the government has met those targets they're published every six months so if people want to go back and look at the December report they'll be able to see all the targets that were met what are the targets for the coming six to twelve months and what is the reform agenda for the coming six to twelve months and that's typically how IMF financing programs for programs operate. But I think the important thing to reiterate in, in the context of Papua New Guinea is the IMF is here. We're here to, to advise and support on the government's reform agenda. And that's what we're here to do. There are three key aspects. I should mention there are three key aspects to, the, to that reform agenda. The first aspect is budgetary, re, budgetary repair and ensuring that the fiscal deficit declines over time and that the country's level of public debt is sustainable over the long term. The second aspect of the of the IMF program is dealing with the effect shortages, which I'm sure we're going to come to, and sort of modernizing uh, the the operations of the central bank. That's the second aspect, and then there's a third aspect, which is a more medium long term aspiration, and that is to improve the governance and transparency of the of the operations of the of the government. Thank you, Sarab. We now go for a quick break. Join us on the other side for more discussions. Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. Now, Saurabh, what is the IMF's assessment of inflation in PNG and what policy advice are you offering to the Papua New Guinean government to stabilize or reduce the rate of inflation in PNG? So I know that this is a topic that gets a lot of public conversation for obvious reasons. Um, if you look at sort of what happened to PNG's inflation in 2023, it was around four or five percent and it declined and it actually went to a historical low of around one percent and so if you look at in the second half of 2023 inflation in PNG was actually very low by historical standards now if you look at what's happened over the last few months it's beginning to sort of uh, go back up again now some of that is probably uh, expected because Inflation was abnormally, ab abnormally low in 2023. Um, so you do see some uptick in inflation again. The IMF, we're projecting inflation in 2024 to be around 4%, which is sort of below the historical average of around 45 to 5%. So the inflation performance in 2023 was good. We we're expecting it to remain that way in 2024. The importance, sort of when it comes to inflation performance, you know, having prudent fiscal and monetary policies is very important and how they interact with each other and how they coordinate with one another. That's very, very important for maintaining P 
PNG's sort of recent record of price stability? Now, in 2023, uh, the Marape government access IMF's credit facilities through a uh, 3.2 billion kina loan, which came with specific conditions. Are you able to disclose that? Just to go back to a question that you asked me earlier, a review was conducted on this program. The report was published in December of 2023. All the conditions specified in the IMF financing program, it's all in there. You know, the IMF believes in transparency. The more transparency, the better. So all the dialogue, all the conversations that we have and sort of all the, the back and forth that we've been having, it's basically summarized in that, in that document. As I said, you know, there are three aspects to the, to the program to do with monetary policy and uh, exchange rate reforms, to do with budgetary, the second pillar is to do with budgetary repair, which is sort of ensuring that the fiscal deficit declines over time and that non-tax revenues and non-resource revenues grow. And then the final aspect is to do with policies, to do with governance and transparency and, and, and so on. So all of that is made transparent so far program performance has been strong um, the, the, the challenge is sort of going forward is to maintain that reform uh, momentum so that we can come back in six months time and say program performance continues to remain strong now based on the IMF's assessment are you able to provide PNG's current uh, debt levels yeah so how does the IMF look at a country's pu uh, public debt what it does is and this, this applies across the board. This, it uses this standard for all countries in its 190 membership countries. It looks at the, the debt accrued by the government. So that, in, that, that sort of includes all, all borrowings domestically and all borrowings externally. And that gives you the stock of a country's, of, of the government's debt. And what it then does is it divides that by the, a country's gross domestic product. And a country's gross domestic product is all the goods and services produced in any single year. And so that is basically the debt to GDP ratio. Now, based on that metric, PNG's uh, current debt to GDP ratio is around 50% of GDP. So going back again, you know, in the report we published in December, we currently view uh, PNG's debt to GDP ratio as, as sustainable. Thank you, Saurabh. We now go for a quick break. Join us on the other side for more discussions. Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. Now, Saurabh, uh, given the shortage of foreign exchange, which has severely hampered private sector development in the country, you were quoted in the Post Korea dated Tuesday, July 4th, 2023, saying that a major root cause of foreign exchange shortage in the country is the overvaluation of the PNG Kina. Could you clarify that assertion? Sure. So the FX issue is, is probably one of the single most pressing economic issues facing this country. If you look at business surveys that have been done over the last few years, businesses rank the FX shortage as the number one or the number two key impediment to their growth and to their investment prospects. So it's, it, it's it, for this country to realize its, uh, realize its potential, we're gonna have to deal, this FX issue is gonna have to be dealt with. And we wanna move to, to use the IMF terminology, Kina convertibility, which basically means anyone who wants access to foreign exchange should be able to access it. The question, uh, to get to the nub of your question, why has this issue come about, is because the current exchange rate system, or I should say until very recently, the exchange rate was kept relatively stable against the US dollar for the, for, the, for the last 10 years. And so regardless of what was happening in the global economy, regardless of what was happening in, in the PNG economy, the exchange rate never really moved anywhere. It wasn't really, it didn't really sort of move to reflect changes in market conditions. Now, because of that, over time, what happened is that the exchange rate, the Kina, became overvalued. Now, what that means very simply is that the price of foreign exchange is probably cheaper than it should be because the Kina is stronger than it should be. So to deal with these issues, 
there's going to have to be some sort of uh, adjustment in the kina to remove some of that overvaluation. Now, because because the kina has been kept steady against the US dollar and hasn't really moved to reflect market conditions over the past decade, to reform this system, it's going to have to be done very slowly and it's going to have to be done gradually and it's going to have to be done in a sequenced way. So it's so while reforming the exchange rate, it's also going to have to be done with the reforms in the fiscal area, with reforms in how monetary policy is done and so on. So the hope is, is that once sort of the exchange rate more reflects market conditions and sort of we move to a, what's called a market clearing exchange rate, that this should help reduce some of the uh, pressure on, the, on, on this country's FX reserves and the FX shortages should hopefully become a lot, lot smaller. And this will also have advantages for, uh, for, the, for the people of this country as well. It will also help promote pr prosperity. If you work in agriculture and you're an exporter, you'll stand to gain from that. Your, your income will be boosted. If you're an importer, one of the biggest costs that you currently face at the moment is, is getting in a queue and waiting for your foreign exchange to arrive. If you can get your foreign, if you can get your foreign exchange a lot easier, that will also reduce a, a business costs for you. So exporters will benefit and importers will benefit as well. And so if this country wants to realize its potential, getting rid of these effect uh, shortages is, is absolutely critical. Can we permanently remove these foreign exchange shortages? And how can we, you know, the, to use the IMF terminology, how can we move to Kina convertibility? And what that means is that anyone who wants access to foreign exchange should be able to, should be able to access it. There's a couple of ways of going about this. This current system with the exchange rate has been around for the last decade, right? So if you want to reform this system, you're going to have to do it in a very slow and a very gradual way, and it's going to have to be sequenced with other policies as well. Why do you want to do that? It's because you don't want to create unnecessary economic uncertainty, economic volatility, because that damages business confidence, which damages investment, which will damage economic growth. So sort of getting to the root cause and dealing with the root cause of this issue is going to have to be done very gradually, very slowly. Now, finally, what is the IMF's medium term outlook for the PNG economy? So our our medium term outlook is that one can be reasonably one can be actually quite optimistic about if you if you look PNG has a lot of inherent advantages. On the one hand, it has a very wealthy neighbour Australia. It also has links to the Pacific. And on the other side, it sort of has a land border with ASEAN and it's connected to ASEAN, which is one of the fastest growing regions of the world economy. We know that the country has a lot of natural resources, so it, it can finance a lot of its development. It's an English-speaking country. So the country has a lot of inherent comparative advantages that would allow one to be, to be optimistic about, about the future. Um, if you sort of look at, but the, but the question is, is how to, how to make sure that the country takes advantage and can uh, can take advantage of all these uh, comparative uh, advantages that it has, um, and the and the, the most important thing is is to continue with the with the with the reforms under the under the IMF program. So, getting rid of the FX shortages, which is the biggest single impediment to to business investment in this country, ensuring that the public finances are on a sound and sustainable footing. And also implementing reforms that improve governance and transparency. When, when things are transparent and businesses know that there's a level playing field and the, the laws are applied equally to, to all businesses, that, that sort of creates greater certainty. It boosts business confidence, boosts investment, which in turn will boost GDP growth and create jobs and prosperity for the people of this country. Because that fundamentally is what, it, what it's all about. Mr. Saurabh Rafik, thank you for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. Well, viewers, that ends this episode of In Focus. Do join us again next week Monday on our regular time slot of 7 p.m. for another episode of In Focus. Till then, good night.
This program was proudly brought to you by Telecom Limited and Daytech.